welcome to Balticon. Um, welcome to the session on bad movie adaptations. Sometimes there are reasonable changes to a work when it's adapted to the big screen, but sometimes you just want to shake the screenwriter and ask, what were you thinking? Come to light in the terrible adaptations of your favorite genre. Um, I'm D.H. Ayer. Uh, I'm a, a member of CIFWA, an indie author. My latest book is uh, Bigfoot is Not Your Friend, which came out about a week ago. Um, I'm here with a wonderful panel of experts. We will be taking questions through Q of A, Q and A at about 20 minutes or so. Um, so please, any questions you have, that's the place to put it and not in comments, not in chat. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask my uh, illustrious panelists to introduce themselves. First, by asking uh, Sean in to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Sean and McGuire. I am one of your guests of honor this year. And I am, so far as I'm aware, the only person who actually admits to using Kenneth Muir's horror films of the 1980s and 1990s as checklists. So I've seen a lot of very bad movies. Okay, uh, Jay. Hi, I'm Jay Smith. I'm a podcaster, audio playwright, and writer. Uh, I grew up through the 80s through some of the worst adaptations of the literature I also grew up with. So I'm interested to talk all about those. Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Kimmel. I'm based in Boston. I'm a, a longtime professional film critic. I also write uh, fiction on the side. Maybe we'll I'll plug that at the end. Uh, probably best known in the science fiction world for this Jar Jar Binks Must Die, my collection of essays on science fiction movies. Um, and I also do a column on classic science fiction movies for Space and Time magazine. So I'm, I'm coming in as a professional cr film critic. So that being said, with bad movie adaptations, I'm really interested in uh, what films in the genre you consider to be uh, bad adaptations. My pet peeve has always been one of my favorite stories, Enemy Mine. Uh, by Barry Longyear just made a total mess of as a movie years ago. Um, and I have difficulty watching it, but I don't want to not watch it because I always love the story. Um, so among bad adaptations, uh, Sean, in what do you, what's always captured your mind as really bad adaptations? Honestly, if it changes the meaning of the story so profoundly that you wonder, why did you pay for this? You know, they've just acquired it to get that name, like The Lawnmower Man, the adaptation of the Stephen King story, which took a really quite reasonable little story about pagan sacrifice and bird baths full of blood and turned it into a big wackadoodle, let's use the 3D CGI that we've just gotten access to. Or legit any adaptation that we've had to date of I Am Legend. The most recent with Will Smith only makes sense if you view the entire film as the aftermath of a successful act of bioterror, because measles will always, always, always go airborne in a lab setting. We know that. That is a genuine fact of the virus. Saying we've used measles to cure cancer, aren't we great? Yeah, no, you've just unleashed a bio apocalypse. Why did you, okay. And it was, it's so profoundly clear they don't understand the story they're adapting. So why did you pay for the story? It's not a big enough deal anymore to be worth the amount of vitriol that you're going to get from the fans. Dan, what do you, what do you I have to say? I come at this from a, a very different angle because I don't think, you know, the, the rule of thumb is, oh, the book is better. No, sometimes the book isn't better. And to answer uh, Shonen's uh, comment, uh, which is a, a popular opinion, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking it, but sometimes uh, uh, filmmakers will buy a property because they like an idea, a character, some aspect of it, and they don't really want to just like do this faithful word for word adaptation. Sometimes it's done, sometimes it's done right, sometimes it's done wrong. I start with the question, do you have a reason to tell this story other than the fact that you own the property? Because there are a lot of movies that get made that 
The only reason it was made is because they think they can make money off of it, not because anybody had a burning desire to tell the story. And I'm, I'm sure we'll all come up with examples of hits and misses. Jay. I, I, I agree with both of you. Uh, I think a film should stand on its own merits, uh, whether it deviates or not from the source material. If it tells a good story, I'm willing to excuse it. Um, but at the same time, it should represent the IP effectively one way or another. Like, I, I was very excited when The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy became a film, and I wanted all my friends who didn't want to read the book to come with me and share in my joy. And at the end of that film, they just looked at me like, what was that? This is something you've invested your, your, your time and passion in? It's so far away from Douglas Adams, and you can't replicate Douglas Adams in film unless Douglas Adams is there doing it. Similar to other writers like Stephen King and Harlan Ellison and those who have a distinct literary voice. So um, I look at it from if you're going to be so um, arrogant enough or, or, or confident enough to take on someone else's artistic work, you better do something good with it. And the, the list that I compiled for this were based on books that I enjoyed and the adaptations that just seemed to fumble and not know what they were trying to do with it. So, uh, Sean, and one of the things I've noticed is uh, Dune's being coming out again in a remake of what was a movie adaptation by Lynch, David Lynch years ago. I mean, does it make sense for us to keep seeing other versions of the same book adaptation, maybe better, maybe worse? I think that sometimes because we have moved into an era where original is aspirational, we forget how humans actually interface with story. We forget the way that our brains process material. My actual degree is in folklore. And humans like to tell the same story over and over and over again. It's a thing that culturally brings us comfort. It's the reason we have fairy tales. It's the reason we have legends. And it's the reason that things like Shakespeare endure. You know, we don't have a new performance of Romeo and Juliet every year because it is the single best love story ever told. We do it because it's familiar. So remaking things to keep them in a modern visual language and in a modern and accessible format is a reasonable thing for a culture to do. We should also be bringing in new stories and we should be giving things an opportunity to age out a little. I don't like how the cycle of remakes is speeding up, but it can be a really great way to sort of see what is currently important to a culture and how things have shifted. My high school drama teacher is actually the person that wrote and directed the Footloose remake. And it is visually not for me. I love Footloose, the original. I was of the appropriate age range for that to be made for me when it first came out. And then the remake was too fast. The cuts were too quick. I didn't get enough dancing. That's because the visual language has moved on and the movie is still made for the age group that the movie is made for. Dan, are you of similar thought or slightly different? Well, my, my well, let me see. There, there, there are there are stories that get told over and over. It's not like, oh, we don't need Hamlet again. That's been done. Of course, you know, like 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 Sean, Sean was saying. Yes, we we need to hear stories. Listen, I'm Jewish. We read the the, the Torah every year. The stories don't change. But our interaction with it, we change. And so it becomes fresh in that way. Uh, but there, there are times when, I'll, I'll give an example of a, a science fiction movie that uh, the, the, the original, The Day the Earth Stood Still, I, I have not read the, sh the short story that it's based on, but the, the 1951, The Day the Earth Stood Still is a classic film. It's, I've taught the film uh, when, I was, when I was teaching a college science fiction film class. Uh, the remake, was an abomination. Why? They tried to track it in so many ways and they also, they modernized it. So instead of the aliens wanting to stop uh, atomic warfare, they wanted to stop ecological disaster. 
But it, it, doing that sort of retelling of a story isn't simply taking one piece out and putting in a modern piece. It's rethinking, why am I doing this? And in the case of The Day the Earth Stood Still, when, the, uh, when, when Keanu Reeves is the, as, as Klaatu uh, uh, shows up, it's not to warn humanity. It's, oh, we're going to be destroying all life on Earth. Then that this is the whole point of the story. So if they're not thinking it through, if they're not going, why am I telling this story? You get a disaster like that. Jay, your your thoughts? Um, I, I think Shakespeare is a great example of of multi generational and multicultural interpretation. It's, it's the works of Shakespeare have been reimagined in in very creative ways. And I think that that allows it to remain fresh to different audiences. I think of the Ian McKellen version of, of Richard III as one of my favorite adaptations. Uh, while I think Kenneth Branagh did a wonderful job as Hamlet, he just went on for way too long. And I actually prefer the Mel Gibson for some reason, mm. although my Shakespeare professor is probably rolling in her grave right now for me saying that. Um, I think you get into something that, that becomes almost cannibalistic, like Star Wars. Uh, it, Star Wars is a, basically the... the this current trilogy is a, basically a remake of the first trilogy and it is so obsessed with um, appealing to such a, a large and wide audience that it fails to tell a good story. It simply wants to sell toys. It simply wants to appease people and get butts in seats that it almost deludes, it dilutes the, the, the strength of the original trilogy in my mind. So uh, it, it, I think it comes down to commerce where you could do a, a, a great Shakespeare film for $10 million, but the Fast and Furious franchise, which has mutated into something really weird, is is just based on how many people in these European and Asian countries can we get to come see our film? How you know how big do the explosions have to be to get us uh, get our money back for the $300 million budget? And so that, I think, uh, lends itself to a lot of the films from that I have on my list that were just, wow, Stephen King is a very popular writer. Uh, these people never read the book, but they know the names, but his name will get their butts in seats. And Stephen King populates about half of my list, so. If, if I can follow up on a, on a couple of things. On the, there's a lot of film versions of Hamlet. It's a matter of taste which one you prefer. I happen to like the Brana one because he did something that nobody else has ever done. He filmed the entire play. Everybody else has shortened it, abridged it, and you know, and, and it makes sense. It's it, uh, you know, uncut. It can run like four hours. Uh, what I liked about it is that he moved the action to the 19th century. When I see something like like the Mel Gibson version, the Laurence Olivier version, it's all these guys running around in leotards. It takes me a while to figure out uh, the relationships between the characters by putting it in the 19th century and putting them in these quasi-military outfits. It was very clear to me what the relationships were just from the costumes, and I could there then focus on the character and the plot. So I, I thought that that he had a good reason to tell to retell that that story. Um, so and I think that's I, an added strength for Richard III as well because they they brought it into that new era, into a more modern era, really. Yeah. Oh, the, 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 the Richard III is just great. It's almost like an alternate history. Okay, so we have uh, an interesting question from the Q&A that I'm going to share. How does medium, both of the original work, whether it's a novel, short story, or comic, and the movie adaptation or TV miniseries affect what makes a good or bad adaptation? Uh, Seanan, can you help me with, it, with that one? I find that a lot of the time, at least for me, the adaptations are better when they start with that shorter work. You know, uh, The Thing is a fantastic horror film. It's absolutely brilliant. And it's based on a very short story that it doesn't actually bear that much similarity to when you compare the story itself to the finished work. Now, the same can be said of The Color Out of Space, the, the recent Nicolas Cage movie. And the adaptation was not good, but the people who made The Thing fulfilled the, the goal that both Daniel and, and Jay have put forward of, do you understand the work? Do you have something to say about the work? Are you taking the work to an interesting new place? And so they made 
an interesting story, an interesting film out of this very short story where there's not a lot of there there. I would argue that Peter Beagle's version of The Last Unicorn, the cartoon, is possibly the single most faithful movie adaptation ever made of a genre work that was actually worth watching at the end. And I don't think it would have worked if we had been dealing with something longer. You know, the, uh, the It movies that have recently come out, I have discovered a new kind of hell. And that hell is having your favorite book become a cultural phenomenon that you hate. Um, I had never been there before because it was never my favorite book because it was too difficult to film. But taking something this freaking long and trying to turn it into even two movies, it did not function. They leave out connective tissue that needs to be there to make the plot points that they're trying to lean on make sense. Uh, Isn't that true of the original uh, version filmed 20 the, years ago? The original teleplay, the, uh, the miniseries with Tim Curry, Stephen King had more involvement with the scripting, although he did not write the script. Um, and they had, like, the people who made it expressed more genuine affection for the source material than was ever expressed by the filmmakers of the films that have recently come out. I think if you love the material, it does make a difference. And some things that should not have worked have worked really well because they were being done by people who loved the material. You know, Heather's the Musical has no business actually being of any quality. And that show is a hard bop, yo. But the TV show is an abomination and should never have been allowed to go to film. Dan, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that, it, it's true. It's good. You know, I, I, I realized that uh, Joss Whedon is not, is not as popular as he was, say, a decade ago. Um, but I remember not wanting to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer because I had seen the movie and the movie was awful. And people were telling me, no, 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 you've got to check out the TV show. I became hooked. I, I, see, I, I watched everything he did on television. I thought, I think Buffy the Vampire Slayer is one of the great genre shows from, from the 90s, if not of all time. So, you know, having somebody with a clear creative vision um, and, you know, and some, a compelling reason to tell the story is a reason to do something, even if, it, if it's making changes or taking it in another direction. On the other hand, I did have to review Cruella, which just opened today. And trying to, basically, it's Disney's version of the Joker. Let's take this horrible villain who we know wants to kill a hundred puppies to make a coat and make her a sympathetic figure because oh, all these people were so mean to her and the Dalmatians snarled at her. I, you know, I, I ended my review saying, I hope they don't realize they also have in Vault Disney the Fuhrer's face you know, for, for a future live action. Oh, let's, let's do a retrofit. So I want to interject something real quick here. Um, I think that viewing the Buffy movie as terrible depends on whether you were the target audience. And that's the thing we do have to keep in mind when we're talking about is a movie good or bad? Was it made for us? I was exactly the age for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie to be targeted at me. I saw it in theaters 17 times because that was the straight up best movie ever made. And I can still recite big chunks of it. It's totally fine that you don't like it but I almost didn't watch the TV show because the movie was perfect and the TV show was just going to ruin it. So well, you know, as, as I, I love to talk, I've been a film critic for, for almost four decades now. And I tell people, look, you know, they, the old joke in Hollywood is everybody has two jobs, their own and be a, being a movie critic. If you've seen a movie, you're entitled to your own opinion. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I have my opinion. Uh, but that's all it is. It's an opinion. It's, uh, some critics think it's the rule of law. I, I don't. Okay. Jay, I want to get uh, your opinion uh, on this and make sure we're not leaving you out oh, no. uh, because I know you're, you've got great things to say here. I, I saw Shannon's face. I wasn't going to get in the way of that train. I knew she. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to, to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because it was conceived as a radio program. And it was it was one of the best radio programs BBC or anybody's ever put out just because uh, it, it used the medium to the best uh, it, uh, potential. 
it's a lot of talking though. There, there are a lot of gags that evoke images in your head um, that, and it, Douglas Adams was writing specifically for that medium. When the BBC wanted to make it into a television show, the only reason it really worked was because of the Doctor Who comparisons. If you accepted that you were gonna have this preposterous story on flimsy sets with goofy rubber monsters, you kind of went with it. it was, there was an element of camp that made that medium work for the show. But they also invented a very clever device to deliver a lot of exposition and a lot of background through the, the computerized animated uh, 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 basically explanations from the actual Hitchhiker's Guide itself. So I thought the television version was good because it knew what it was and it wasn't going to try to be anything more than that. When it went to the big screen and Disney got its claws into it, it just it lost that sense. So I don't think that film itself was necessarily the best medium. When you have a story that is as as epic in scope as Hitchhikers, even even the BBC realized that it would need a mini series to properly encapsulate the best parts of it and create the right arc to tell its story. The film decided, how can I cram all of this into 90 minutes, which is something that I see in most of the movies that I dislike. It took you know, the Dark Tower is an amazing, epic story, and I can, we can do this in 90 minutes or two hours, and you're just, you can't do the stand in one season the way that Paramount tried to do it. Uh, it just, it, uh, like Douglas Adams, Stephen King is an author who can put you inside the head of multiple characters from multiple POVs and scare the hell out of you by just revealing that character to you. It's very difficult to take that from a book and put it onto the big screen. Uh, and I, I will say that uh, one of my favorite novels of his, which is probably not on the top of most King fans, is Needful Things. I love that book just because it was so detailed and so inside the head of all of these characters who were being moved like chess pieces. When Ed Harris did his version of that, uh, it angered me because that was one of those things where, like, I know you don't want to read this 900 page book. This paper brick is not to your fancy, but come with me and look at the movie and maybe you'll like it. And no, no, it kind of worked against me on that point. But that that's what I think. So this goes back to what along those was. lines. What did you guys think of the film Odd Thomas compared to the book? Do you think that was faithful or not even close? Or, I mean, I don't think I don't I think any the book. I don't know the movie. See. And that's what I think a really bad adaptation is that no one even goes to bother to see it. Uh, I read I the book. a few hundred movies a year. I, I, that, when was this released? Odd Thomas is, was Anton Yeltsin uh, probably seven, eight years ago as, as Thomas, as Odd Thomas. Look, to me, that just says that it was a really bad adaptation. No one even cared to go out. Uh, because it was the first book of a, of a series that just didn't, and we never saw any sequels. Sean, and I see you're, you're gesturing, so. I have no familiarity with the book. I'm not a Dean Koontz fan, uh, because I have this thing about wanting to read books where women have agency and exist. But I actually really enjoyed Odd Thomas, movie, which means that it qualifies on one of the, the things that an adaptation needs to do, you know, can it stand alone? Can you have fun? Um, the Harry Potter movies and to a degree Lord of the Rings both fell down for me because if you went to see the film and you didn't have intimate familiarity with the source material, what the heck? I don't understand what's happening. They've left out so much of the connective tissue that it's falling apart. You know, Jay brought up Dark Tower. I left that theater literally incandescent with rage. And part of it was that we've got this whole film trying to compress the entirety of the tower by making Jake the POV character for some ridiculous reason. And we're supposed to be concerned that beam quakes are happening. What the hell's a beam? They did not tell us. All things serve the beam, but the movie never explained that. So why do I care if the beams are shaking? Odd Thomas stands alone with no familiarity with the source material, and so it was worth it. Okay. Well, part so, of the problem is, is too many Hollywood screenwriters 
um, are following a, a formula. They're, they're trying to hit certain beats. There's a whole, there, there are books you can get on how to write a screenplay and you've got to have a conflict on, after so many pages. And one of the worst things that I have found is this notion that, and of course the hero and the villain have to have this big climactic battle at the end. And so there are movies that force that where it's not in the original material and the story doesn't really call for it. Uh, one, of the, one of the most ridiculous examples for me was uh, Exodus, God, Gods and Kings, you know, the uh, uh, sort of like a remake of the Ten Commandments. Well, I know the story very well. And one of the most dramatic moments in the story is after the 10th plague, when Moses you know, goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, all right, you can go. And if I see you again, I'm, you know, I'm going to kill you. I, you, you know, I get out of my sight. And Moses' response is, we will not see each other again. And he, he leaves and leaves the exodus out of Egypt. Not in the movie. In the movie, Moses and Pharaoh have to have a big fight during the parting of the sea. Why? Because we need a fight between the hero and the villain. That's, that, that to me is formulaic and unthinking script writing. Jay, any thoughts before I go to Q&A? No, I will say I, I was just turned on to this YouTube channel called uh, Screen Rant, and there's a segment there called Pitch Meeting. If you've ever seen it, it's just the same actor writes out what what the writer and what the director or producer were thinking about these preposterous adaptations. So if, if anybody wants to see that, it's a it's a great representation of, of how you could take a great idea and mangle it into something something uh, unwatchable almost in some cases. So from the Q&A is uh, a very quick question. What are your views on the Dune book movie and miniseries? Uh, Seanan, you want to start with uh, a response? I don't give a shit. At all. The only good thing Dune has ever done for my life is inspire a couple of book songs that I enjoy. So I have no thoughts. Okay. Jay? Um, honestly, the, the Dune the book was too many vodka tonics ago, and a David Lynch film is a David Lynch film. I don't, don't care who the source material is. Okay, because there's a new Dune one coming out, I think, in September. Uh, Dan? Uh, yeah, I, I read the book quite a while ago. I read the, the, the Frank Herbert books. I haven't read the, the sequels that his son and others have been involved with. Of the, I've seen all the movie versions out so far. Um, I thought the da the original David Lynch film was interesting. Um, you can argue whether it's a success or not, but I, it was, to me, it was it was interesting to watch. Then they recut it for television, and he took his name off of it, and that is just that's horrible. And I the miniseries I found kind of dull. So we'll see what they do with the new one. It, ultimately, and this gets back to something Sean said earlier, I, I think that adapting short stories works a lot better than trying to tackle these epic novels because you're either leaving too much stuff out or you're, uh, you're, you end up uh, like the, with the Harry Potter uh, films. In the end, the, the, last, the last book, they had to split in half and do two movies. Um, I'm looking at questions in the Q&A. Um, one question from uh, Virginia Richards-Taylor is, do any of the panelists know if there is some rule when you throw the author's name, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, that you were supposed to follow the book? Sometimes it seems that there's a rule that says putting the author's name means you don't, you have some leeway on that one. Well, any thoughts? <laughs> those are out of copyright. So they're, they're just exploiting the name. You know, it's the same sort of thing, like based on a true story. Yeah, the same thing is I, I think um, Stephen King adaptations are there for the marquee value, not necessarily the, the intended quality of the product. Uh, so whenever you can add a brand to your film, it's it's free marketing. Shauna? The only time there's a rule is if you are talking to an author of large stature, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, Neil Gaiman, that they can get things contractually folded in during the sales process. 
you know, Neil Gaiman likes to talk about how when casting is happening for one of his projects, he approves everything because he cares. And it's like, my dude, you're not approving everything because you care. You're approving everything because you can. I don't have that power. We have sold a bunch of stuff to Hollywood. I'm lucky if we are able to get them to include, will be consulted on casting in the contract sales. And without that contract, there are no rules. Do what you want. Yeah. Have you seen the Carnosaur movie? It bears no resemblance at all to the book. Yeah, years and years ago, I got to interview Gene Roddenberry. It's one of the few interviews, like, I can't believe I got to meet this guy. And it was just around the time the Star Trek movies were starting to come out. And I asked him, what involvement did he have with the movies? He said, oh, I have full consulting rights. They, they show me everything and I give my comments and then they do whatever they feel like. You know, the, the, he says, the, he says, the only thing that the consulting meant was he said, at the day they beam down on a planet and start shooting everybody in sight, that's when he was gonna walk off. He says, other than that, like, he didn't like the uniforms in the movies. He told them and they said, thank you very much. And they did what they wanted. Okay, so from the Q&A is, is a very simple question. How do you make a blockbuster movie better? Any thoughts based on what we've been talking about? Seanan, any thoughts? If there was a formula, everybody would actually just use it. The things that are phenomenally successful, I would say, are frequently luck and timing more than anything else. Now, if I'm getting to consult, have people in your screenwriting room that are not just straight white men. That makes a huge difference. Uh, practical effects whenever possible. There's a reason the first Jurassic Park still looks amazing and Jurassic Park 2 and 3 are, are basically unwatchable. And if you can, if you've licensed a property, involve the author at least a tiny bit. Not that you want to deal with someone being super precious about every comma, but what were you trying to say here? What was the purpose? What were you doing? Because frequently the better adaptations, the blockbuster adaptations, are the ones that involve the author at some point to ask that question of. Not all of them. Stephen King wrote and directed Maximum Overdrive. But, you know, proportionately, it does help. Dan? Yeah, David Cronenberg, there was a, in an interview in a book I read, uh, talked about the dead zone. And he said he was uh, given a, a version of the script for the dead zone by King. And he said if he filmed that, the, he said he, he would have been crucified, that it was such an awful script that the, uh, the you know King's fans would have turned on him, blaming him for what was actually the script. And they ended up getting another writer to do it. Um, yeah, the, I would say in terms of, to get back to the question of, of uh, how do you improve a blockbuster, um, make, make us care about the characters. You know, if they're just stick figures, if they're just, you know, mannequins, then go ahead, stomp on them, blow them up, I don't care. But if, if I actually care about these people, then whether Martians are landing or dinosaurs are on, on the rampage or whatever, then I'm going to care about what, you know, what, what happens next. Jay. I, I agree with that. I think um, one of the things that the fast and furious franchise gets right is that it has used the, the, the film series to develop its characters and that and the relationships as thin as they might be to some people, they are the a driving force uh, to bring people back into seats. The family relationships and, and the depths of the characters as the, as they progress across the franchise. That's one redeeming quality that, that has put butts in seats on the, in the global marketplace. I'm not a big fan of the series, but I got to give it props for doing that right. And Avengers has done the same thing. Although it took 10 years, everybody cared about everybody at Endgame. Um, and it, it never... It never shies away from getting to know the character behind the mask and i guess the question kind of tripped me up a little bit because how do you make a blockbuster better to me a blockbuster is simply a film that's released in summer or at christmas that makes a lot of money so how do you make that better it's that would be targeting its release date and its marketing and all that thing if you want to make a better film uh maybe it's not a blockbuster 
maybe the story that you want to tell in the medium of film is something you release in the spring that's that you took a lot more time thinking and developing out that you're not so much caring about the the initial box office maybe it's something that you're positioning for an oscar or golden globe but something that 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 goes back to your old film school days where you're thinking about how to visually present something in a unique or at least fresh way that doesn't involve uh you know the the, the typical summer blockbuster multiple povs uh, um, a film edit every two seconds that kind of thing it's really it's in it's focusing more on the story that you're telling and allowing the screenwriter if they're if they're the strong element there to guide the production of the story afterwards okay i'm going to pull one more question for from the q a with all that we've said about adaptations today would you consider having a work of yours adapted in a film visual medium knowing the risks. Now, uh, Seanan, I think you had an answer to that that I've already heard based on. I'm, yeah, I really like money. Money is magic. We live in a capitalist society and money is just, it's not great. I wish we could get rid of it, but we need money to live in this world that we've built. We need health. I need to pay my electric bill. Television and film change everything literally everything every author you've heard of that is number one with a bullet you know always at the top of the bestseller lists always there they have something that people could watch on a screen a poorly performing movie a movie that completely tanks and fails at the box office is still seen by millions more people than buy books in our current culture there's a film i really love by an author named david Wong called john dies at the end it's not necessarily the best adaptation by my own definition of a good adaptation because they left out so much that I'm not certain the movie makes sense if you're not familiar with the book. But I love the book. He had originally published John Dies at the End as an indie author via his website, and then it got repackaged by Permuted Press, which was a small horror publisher specializing in zombie fiction. Because the right person read it and they turned it into a movie, he is now a best-selling author, New York Times starting, major publisher, multiple sequels, having a great career. And that is all attributable to a movie that may or may not actually be any good. My, uh, my financial advisor estimates that if any of the things currently in development actually go to screen, based on the career patterns of other authors at a similar position in terms of book sales, I'll clear nine to $12 million just from book sales. I would really like nine to $12 million. I could pay the health insurance for my entire family. I could buy a house for my baby sister who's currently living in a storage container. You know, there is so much I could do with that much money. I would kill for an actually on film adaptation of anything I've written. I don't care if it's bad. Do what you want, make it porn, have a good time. It's fine. It's actually secretly a Saw sequel now. That's cool by me. I really want to get paid. The uh, the author mantra. <laughs> what are you paying me? <clears throat> Dan, any thoughts? I, I agree 100%. And as a matter of fact, if there's anybody out there who's looking to uh, <laughs> looking to adapt it, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to sell. The, uh, the, the problem is that sometimes it could be a bad movie. And to that, um, I would answer uh, the Tom Wolfe when they made that awful movie, A Bonfire of the Vanities. Somebody came up to him, and this may be apocryphal, I, this may be something they just attribute to various authors, but the way I heard it is somebody came up to Tom Wolfe and said, look what they did to your book. And he said, they didn't do anything to my book. You can still read it. So yeah, take the yeah, money and yeah. run. And in fact, somebody, I saw somebody had a quote, a great rant. Yes, I'll, I'll give you a great rant, but check out Harlan Ellison on YouTube, pay the author. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking <laughs> when Sean had spoke. Jay, you yeah, got the I, last, we, we have to close up. We're, we're, at, we're at the five minute mark. The uh, There's 10 minute warning, excuse me. There's uh, two points of view. Uh, Alan Moore still cashes the check. He has, he doesn't care. Uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was one of the worst films I've ever seen. He still got paid, and he's doing pretty well for himself. 
Uh, on the other hand, Greg, Gregory McDonald, who wrote the Fletch series, yeah. uh, wrote in one of his introductions that he had some problems with the Fletch script for the first film. He wasn't sure that Chevy Chase was the right person and he had all these opinions. And the director took him out to dinner one night and explained to him the process of filmmaking, after which McDonald said, I don't want to make any decisions. I, it's not my wheelhouse. I don't care. I'll cash the check and just try and make me look good. Not that I have I, anything, but if, you know, if anybody is, sure. Mm -hmm. I have legitimately only one case of a movie adaptation being so bad that it materially hurt the author. And in that case, there was a court case going on at the time and strong evidence that the person the author was suing for plagiarism had funded the movie. And that is Harry James Knight's Carnosaur, which um, is a British horror novel not necessarily the best British horror novel, but stop me if you've heard the story. It is about scientists finding a way to extract DNA from mosquitoes preserved in amber and deciding that what they should do with it is grow dinosaurs and then open a theme park. But unfortunately, they pick the wrong dinosaurs, including Deinonychus, which is a velociraptor relative that is the size of the ones that you've seen on screen and are now trying not to picture. There was hard evidence given the timing of the book that uh, there had been some theft on the part of Michael Crichton. And Harry James Knight was suing him for plagiarism when he died of uh, cancer, uh, one of the cancers, pancreatic cancer. He left no estate, the case was closed. There is actually a money trail indicating that Crichton may have funded the Carnosaur movie, which bears no resemblance to the film, but turned the court case into, oh my God, the author of... <laughs> Carnosaur is suing the guy that wrote Jurassic Park. Like it made it a laughing stock. And that is the only example I can give of a movie adaptation being bad enough to hurt the book or the author. Okay, is we that, have a couple of minutes before we have to wrap. Uh, I'm just curious, yeah. was that movie uh, produced by Roger Corman's wife? I don't know. It sounds familiar Ooh. because I think I go to the science fiction movie marathon in the Boston area every year. And she came, and I think that was the movie they showed. And then she left before she showed another of her movies, which is really one of the worst adaptations ever of Isaac Asimov's Nightfall. Hmm. Not yeah. getting the story. It was produced by Roger Corman and Mike Elliott. So yeah, I, yeah, I think- How much involvement his wife had. I think, I think she may have been the line producer. Yeah, it managed to be anti-government, anti-science, anti-woman, and anti-dinosaur all at the same <laughs> time, which is an astonishing hat trick. Like, <laughs> go team you. Jay, any thoughts before we begin our wrap? Uh, I think I said my piece on that question. Was there? Okay. No. Okay. Um, we've got six minutes to the end. So I'm gonna have a start wrapping now rather than start another question. Um, can everyone tell us where we're gonna see you guys um, during Balticon and any other last minute thoughts um, to share? Seanan? You're gonna see me all the frick over, over Balticon. They've got scheduled like they're paying me. It's kind of fantastic. So I am nicely occupied. Just check your program. It would take more time than we have left to list them all. Okay. Dan? Uh, I'm doing a reading at five o'clock in the con suite or the virtual con suite. And I'm doing a panel uh, at 1130 on Saturday, one at one o'clock on Sunday. I forget which is which. One is about Godzilla and the other one is about uh, the changing face of fandom. Jay? Uh, I have two more panels this afternoon. I have a reading tomorrow uh, and some stuff on Sunday as well. So i uh, just check the program. Okay. So people can find me um, on Gather because I've got a booth in the uh, virtual dealer's room. Um, I'm the author of Bigfoot is Not Your Friend. He really isn't in this book. Uh, it's an apocalyptic uh, spoof. Um, I hope we see everyone throughout the con. Um, I'm on panels. My website will... Uh, dhair.net will uh, list where you can find me uh, during Balticon. Um, anyone else have last thoughts as we we close off the panel? 
Okay, then I think we've uh, we've pretty much we wrapped. Covered. Okay, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Uh, <laughs> someone just posted on chat. Can we see a movie adaptation of this panel? Um, I don't know <laughs> how to answer that. Uh, Brad Pitt should play me. I would be That's the invisible Brad Pitt in the Dead Two film, <laughs> electrified, and you don't see it, see when you get electrified. So, um, it's wonderful you're all here at Balticon. Uh, Sean, in w welcome as guest, one of the guest of honors. It's a pleasure to have had you on this panel. Jay, you've been great. Dan, you've been great. Um, on that note, I'm going to sign us off, and wish everyone a great Balticon. Thanks for having me. See you later.